Slowing the spread of COVID-19 in Carroll County can't be done by just one individual organization or group. It takes all of us working together to protect each other. While Carroll County's agencies work together regularly to coordinate services and outreach, we are truly united in our goal to protect our community and ensure our residents have the resources to care for anyone diagnosed with COVID-19. We need you to be part of the hashtag Carol Forward movement, working with us to foster community strength and resilience and slow the spread. While the road to recovery may be long and have a lot of curves, we are committed to moving Carol Forward together. Uh, with that, Ed, I'd like you to get on and share with us uh, where we're at with, uh, you know, both COVID-19, the vaccinations, and what uh, expectations we should have over the next few weeks. So, Ed. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, sometimes I have a few comments before I roll right into my presentation, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, I think roll with the presentation this morning because a lot of uh, what I want to talk about is is uh, right in the uh, in in the slides that I'll be sharing with you. Okay. All right. Um, let's start with uh, just some of the data. I know uh, that um, that the uh, the Commissioner Fraser had uh, had shared with you um, that uh, one of that we're kind of in a uh, in a, in a high uh, transmission, uh, well, actually we've gone from high transmission, which is the red zone, to substantial transmission, uh, which is kind of the, the, the area that's in the orange by, by CDC metrics. Now, the, the only problem with that is, um, you know, if you, look at a, if, if you look at our week of uh, February the 14th, um, the, the CDC metrics, the way they're calculated, only include those confirmed PCR cases and almost half of our cases that that we know are positive for COVID are our are, are rapid tests that were done. We had about a, hundred, a little over 100 cases that were PCR confirmed, but about 80 more cases that were not confirmed with a PCR that were done by rapid tests. So we're actually in a what's considered, we've gone from a high rate of transmission to what's considered to be a substantial rate of transmission by, uh, by CDC metrics. And, you know, the thing that I'd point out to you is if you look back, you know, this is, uh, we're, we're still at a higher point than we were uh, in late October and early November, and and we're we've still got the spread. I, I I'm hopeful that, and and I, I know I always hear Commissioner Rostein tell me that uh, hope's not a plan, but you you know you you can't predict where the numbers are going to go for certain, and we may see some some more blips on the screen, peaks and valleys. But uh, we've gotten over that big holiday hump. We're getting more people vaccinated. Um, springtime is when more people do activities outside, so. You know, we, we can all hope that the uh, that the trend keeps in a downward in a downward manner. But we're not at, we're not in a great spot right now. We still have a substantial rate of transmission in Carroll County. We still need to stick to what we're doing to try to um, reduce our transmission rates. And uh, you know, we're 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 looking to continue to see this trend move the way that it is. And, and you know, more than anybody else. I, I, I want to get back to the life as normal and and, uh, and be able to take a breath and, and, and move on from this. It's, it's going to be a few more months, though. I think, you know, as we've talked about this over the last several months, I've told you that I would expect that maybe by summertime or fall, we, we're going to get back to as close to normal as we can. It's, it's you know, as, as vaccines more uh, readily available and, and we, we knock these transmission rates down. So, that's kind of where I see things, where we are and where we're going with the uh, with the cases. I, as you can see, our 14-day rolling average certainly shows that that same downward trend. And the only thing uh, I'll mention on this slide here, and I mentioned it on the Board of Education meeting last night, our our, our cases in in uh, the uh, youth that are under the age of 18, they've they've always been relatively very very low throughout most of this pandemic, where uh, and we were seeing less than five cases a, a, a week in, in people under the age 18 until we got into uh, the October timeframe. And, and um, you know, since October, we've, we've seen this kind of align with uh, where the trends are going in all the other age categories and, and a significant uh, greater number of cases in, in, uh, in, in people under the age of 18. 
hospitalizations by week. Uh, the hospital, I'll say, they, they're able to take a little bit of a breath right now, too. Um, the, the most recent information that the uh, hospital president shared with me is they've got about 15 people or so that are being treated for COVID in, in, their, uh, in, the, in the hospital. I think, um, you know, there's really, we never really set a baseline for this, but I, I kind of keep looking at where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, the highest we reached were, were cases in the 20s that were, were being treated in the hospital. And I'm happy to see that, that we're down at least below that. And, and hopefully we'll continue to see a downward trend there too. Um, this is our overall hospitalizations and, and uh, deaths by age group. And the, the one thing that we don't have real good news on yet is, is uh, we're still continuing to see fatalities from COVID, uh, both in facilities and in the community. Uh, so far this week, that's not even on the chart. Uh, we had, uh, had three additional deaths last week. And uh, so far this week, we have uh, two uh, additional facility deaths and one more community death. So they tend to lag the cases. Um, most of the time, I think we're, we're seeing when people die from COVID, it's probably, you know, somewhere in the range of three to five weeks after they've uh, contracted the, the, the disease. So as we're, uh, as we're getting into uh, lower numbers of uh, people testing positive and, and a number of positive cases, hopefully we'll see this uh, rate of deaths require, um, decline as well. Um, this is an important piece that I want to share with you today, and this is our, our this is a new chart that I've added. Um, it's our Ag Center testing data, and what I want to draw your attention to is if you look at where we are right now, um, our demand for testing is, is down to the point where it was when we first kicked off uh, testing up at the Ag Center, and we were trying to ramp things up, and you know we we started with uh, making 50 tests a day available when we were testing there. And, and we gradually um, made, made more, more and more slots available. And during the peak of the, uh, of the uh, pandemic, as far as the numbers are concerned, we were seeing, we, we had a capacity to test 250 people per day at, at the testing site. The, uh, the numbers have dropped off dramatically. Today, we've only got 10 people scheduled to come to, a, uh, to, to the mass testing site. I think part of the reason is, is that testing is available um, not only through us, but also through the um, through the urgent cares and some of the private pharmacies. And um, because our numbers are so low, I believe we're, we're going to look at, and, and, I, and I want your input, I'm going to stop here when I'm done talking about this and just see if you have any concerns, but we're looking at moving to testing on Sunday and Thursday rather than Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday. It, it's just not efficient to run a mass testing site if you've only got 10 or 15 people showing up to be tested and, and the numbers are just uh, dropping off the table right now. We will have the ability that if, if, if suddenly, you know, we had 50 people a day showing up, we can certainly go back to doing Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday testing. It's just that it's, it's, a, it's a lot of effort and all to stand up a testing site for a day. And if, we, if we're not getting at least 40 or 50 people in to be, be tested, it's not a lot of sense to run it uh, three days a week. So we're looking to scale back, uh, possibly be beginning as early as next week, uh, the Sunday and Thursday. So I'm going to stop there and uh, give you guys the opportunity that if you have any concerns about that or if you've got any questions about that, that you can go ahead and ask. And then we'll move on with my presentation. Ed, I believe uh, applying resources where it makes sense. So... Uh... Yeah, I 100% I agree with you. I got tested as I shared, uh, you know, when, you know, we were quarantined. I got tested over at CBS, one with a rapid and one with the uh, PCR, whatever you call it, the long term. And I was able to get uh, tested within the day uh, of my request. I think they're out there. Um, so, yeah, if it's pulling your resources where they could be used somewhere else to serve, I'm I think it's a very smart move, but that's my two cents. Commissioner Weaver? Yeah, and uh, I see the school systems also looking to put a testing system in for their uh, employees and students. So if they have any symptoms, they go immediately for a test. Uh, and uh, that'll cut down probably your testing also at the Ag Center. So uh, I think it's probably a smart move on your behalf. And, and I was going to cover that. It's, uh, it, you jumped ahead of me just a, uh, 
a bit, Commissioner, and I'm going to cover that right after we're done talking about this. Anybody else regarding this? Well, I think it's a good idea to, to cut down on testing at your site because, as uh, Commissioner Rothstein said, um, you can almost go anywhere and get a test now. I had actually got a test a couple of weeks ago. I went online that day, got a test that day, the rapid test, and with 20 minutes, I was told I was cleared, and then they took the other test and sent that away. Yep. So you can get a test so many different places. I don't think it's necessary to have it open three days a week at the Ag Center right now. Okay, and anyone yeah, else? I, th I think communications can be very important as we transition, and I'm sure that's gonna be out there, but uh, yeah, I think it's a smart move. Um, I agree. Any, no, hearing nothing else, uh, Ed, please continue. And, and the important thing to realize, commissioners, is if we were to hit another peak, um, as long as we're, I'm not looking to totally shut the site down, and and I I don't think uh, the state wants me to do that. They 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 want us to continue to make sure that his uh, testing's accessible. If we cut back to two days a week, and as long as we still have the relationship with the ag center and we've kind of got things in place, I can always put more resources towards it and ramp it back up. So uh, that that's where we're going to be headed, and uh, I'm glad you guys are comfortable with it. Um, hey, the Ed, the thing that commissioner hey, Ed, yes, Ed, just a quick question: What two days were you going to do? Did you say Sunday and Thursday? Sunday and Thursday, and it's kind of funny. I I, uh, I told the staff, I said, so um, let's let's go to doing uh, Monday and Thursday or or Tuesday and Friday, and they're like, nope, we like Sundays. And I was like, why okay. do you like? I was trying to give them the weekend well, off, and they said, no, they want to stick with Sunday. <laughs> okay, well that's why I asked because I know that the Ag Center has been trying to get more events scheduled up there, and they're doing a great job. They've got really tremendous best practices in place up there, especially in the Shipley arena. They've got a counter that, that actually shows how many people are in and out the door. Yeah. So my only, my, my only suggestion would be, that's fine, working with them maybe, they, it would be nice if we could get away from that Sunday if we could at some point to allow them to maybe start to phase in a little bit more activity because a lot of the things that they do are on the weekend. So that, that was my only suggestion there. Okay, well, let, I'll, I'll talk to uh, Richard Brace, who's running this site for us, and, and uh, have him talk to the staff that are working with him and see if we could uh, take a look at that. Uh, the one thing I will mention with the Ag Center, and, and I've got a, uh, we're having some discussions, some of these uh, seated performances are still restricted by the, uh, the state orders. Um, there, there's a lot of things they can do, but there's certain things uh, uh, that, that we're going to have to talk about the, with them, such as... Uh, they're going to do a tractor pool. I'm not sure that they're going to be able to do that. It's 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 it, we got to look at how those orders apply and 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 things of that nature. So we're we're in the middle of reviewing some some situations with them. We've been trying to make sure that they're compliant with all the orders and whatnot that are in place. But uh, we'll take a look at those dates as well and and try to see how we can best work that for them. Thanks. Okay. So on to the uh, the the testing that Commissioner. Um, Weaver had referenced with the school system. Um, the, the governor offered a few weeks ago to make uh, testing supplies available to the schools. Um, I don't know if you all, if we've discussed this before or not, but essentially the health department is the uh, medical oversight. Dr. Taylor is the uh, medical director for the school system when it comes to uh, anything that would require a doctor's order. So we're working very closely with the school system. The, try to figure out how we would staff. Um, essentially, we're looking at regional sites. What we talked about conceptually to start with was, was possibly having testing sites at each of the high schools because it's it's not practical for us to put testing sites in each of the schools throughout the county. There's just, staffing would be impossible. The, the school nurses have enough on their plate. They just couldn't do this. So we, we talked about looking for agency uh, nurses and, and uh, regionalizing test sites and having the feeder schools potentially uh, come to each of the high schools. Now, one of the things we were concerned about was not having to have people track into the building who were sick. So, so the school system's looking at options such as potentially uh, using empty portables or something like that to have as the, uh, the testing site. But the, the concept is, is anytime somebody's sick and might have COVID, um, that the parent has to come and pick them up from school anyway. So we could do a consent form ask the parent to take them to wherever that regional testing site is, that whether it be at the high schools, so somewhere that's gonna be local, they would, this would solve the problem of them needing to get an appointment or do anything else. And, and they'd be able to just go there and they would do a rapid test. 
and, and they send off a PCR test. This will help us in, in trying to keep down the number of kids that are in quarantine because they've been exposed to somebody that has symptoms or is suspected of having COVID. And also, if, if, the, if the person doesn't, the staff member or the uh, student doesn't actually have COVID, will be uh, helpful in, in getting them back to school in a more timely manner and, and being able to clear them from, uh, from isolation and, and be able to uh, return to school. We haven't worked out all the details yet, but we're working very closely with the superintendent and, and his staff and, and Dr. Taylor and, and uh, Philippa Gomes, who uh, oversees all the, all the nurses in the schools and Carl Streaker to, uh, to figure out exactly what this would look like and make this resource available to parents. I really think it would make things a lot more convenient for, for the parents of uh, students and for the staff just to have this uh, test, essentially testing on demand available regionally throughout our school system. So that's what that's, what that's intended to look like. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping to roll that out in the early part of March. Okay, so getting, uh, getting back to our pyramid that we, talk, we, we always talk about, I always throw this in there. We're still kind of in the 1B, well, we're still firmly in the 1B category with what we're doing with our vaccinations right now. And I know I've got a lot of frustrated 65 to 74 year olds who, who we're, not, we're not vaccinating yet that, uh, that, that, that are a little bit frustrated with us at the health department because they've been on our list for a long period of time and we just haven't had enough vaccine to vaccinate all the people who are over 75 and at much more risk. And you know, you gotta draw the line somewhere. And as Maggie Coons, my uh, PIO puts it, this was a really bad year to be 74 if you wanted to get vaccinated because uh, <laughs> you know, we are, we are focusing on the 75 plus. And, and you know, I get people that call me every day saying, well, my birthday's in six months, can I get a, and you gotta draw the line somewhere. And we're trying to be as fair about this as we can. And we, we, we appreciate people's patience. And I'm going to talk a little bit as we get into these slides about where I think we are and where we might be going. So as I mentioned, we're, we're mainly doing uh, 1A and 1B right now. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead at this point on this slide and talk a little bit about the registration system has been a nightmare for us. It was given to us by the state. They're not using it at their mass vaccination sites because they figured out that it didn't work really well for them. and, and uh, so they, they're going to a different system, but it's it's that's only going to be for the mass vaccination sites. We're still going to be using prep mod. However, we've really been pushing the state to, to make enhancements to the registration system. And one of the problems we've had is, um, is is using these links. And I've talked about people sharing links. And there are a lot of good hearted people out in the community that want to help uh, some of the elderly folks get registered. And, and, and in some of our sign up sheets, I've got uh, 200 people who are signed up that are over 75, all with the same email address because some friend from a church group or something signed them up. And it's very confusing to them right now when they receive a link as to who we're vaccinating, who this is offered for. And, and uh, you know, we try to make it clear in the email that goes out, but they're never sure whether it's specifically for Commissioner Wance or for Commissioner Weaver. Um, the state's supposed to be rolling out a new enhancement uh, that's supposed to start tomorrow where we're going to be able to upload a, a, uh, a list of names and email addresses and send out a link that's specifically for that person. And it'll come out and it'll say, Commissioner Weaver, you're being uh, invited to register for a, for a vaccine for through uh, Farrell County Health Department Clinic on this date and this time and click on this link and, and you can sign up. That link will only work once. So if Commissioner Weaver sends it to Commissioner Boucher and Boucher beats him the signing up, Weaver's not going to be able to uh, sign up for the clinic. So um, it, it's going to be very helpful to us in trying to reach those those uh, people that we're targeting in our clinics. And it'll help, um, I guess, eliminate some of the frustration we have with people who are trying to sign up for clinics that they're not eligible for, because this is going to specifically target an email address and a person's name, and it's going to be good once. And, and, and uh, they can sign up for the clinic, and we can get them registered. And you know, I've said a number of times that uh, when people come to the clinics, they've been very happy with ha how well things are run there. You know, I've had no control over this registration system, and this has been the, the big point of frustration for citizens in our county. And hopefully these uh, enhancements are going to help make this, uh, this better and less frustrating for people. 
It's not going to make them get vaccinated any quicker. So if they're frustrated because they're 65 and Ed Singer won't go on to uh, vaccinate 65-year-olds until he gets done to 75-year-olds, um, it's not going to help with that. But it will help with uh, the problems we've had with registration. <laughs> so this is our, our graph on the vaccine rollout. Um, we've we've uh, we're we're essentially getting a, a thousand doses a week now, and we're we're getting projections four weeks out, which is helpful. It's helped us in our planning. And if you'll notice, if you're looking at some of these, uh, the green the green thing is how how much we're allocated for each week. And you'll see in a couple places where the blue bar exceeds the green bar. And what's happening there is now that I know that I'm getting a thousand doses per week, they generally show up on a Monday or a Tuesday. I can actually use them the same week that I'm receiving them. So I'm 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 forward. Uh, I guess I'm forward fronting some of this vaccine without taking a risk that we're not going to have vaccines show up and have to cancel a clinic. Um, for instance, this week what I did was. I told the school system, I'm going to give you, uh, I, I promised them a certain percentage of our doses every week. So for, for the next three weeks, I knew I was going to give them 150 doses, plus I owed them 50 doses from last week. So we took all those uh, doses that we're going to give them over the next three weeks, and we vaccinated uh, 500 people over at Winters Mill, uh, 500 teachers and other educational staff over at Winters Mill. And that means they won't get doses for the next two weeks, but we've... Uh, been able to get some of the teachers vaccinated sooner and get that vaccine out essentially the the uh, within a within a day of receiving it as opposed to uh, waiting six or seven days till we we can actually get a clinic scheduled. So we're putting a little bit of that up front now, and uh, we're we're doing a really good job. Uh, last week when I looked at the chart, we were at 104 uh, percent of our first doses administered, and that was because um, you know we are getting a little bit of extra out of some of the vials, so our um, our staff are just doing a great job in, in getting people vaccinated. Um, this is the uh, <laughs> this is where I want to talk about our plan, where we are, what we're doing, who we vaccinated, and what we think we've got left. So we'll start with our our plan, and and well, I guess I want to start with where we are. The um, we we've got about uh, we we've we've vaccinated about almost uh, 4,600 people in the education sector, and that includes private schools, daycares, and Carroll County public schools. Um, I think we're pretty much done with the demand that we had in, in Group 1A, which is the healthcare providers and first responders. Uh, we're not getting a lot of demand from those folks to sign up for additional clinics. I offered a clinic last Monday that was for, for um, for private schools and daycare providers and, and 1A, and the clinic did not fill up, so we opened it up to uh, the public schools. I, I had that separate set aside for public schools for, for vaccine, but this was specifically for daycare providers, private schools, and, and, for, uh, and, and for people who would be in group 1A, and that clinic didn't fill up, so we're, we're not planning on having a, a, another clinic for that targeted population in the very near future, although some people reached out to me after the uh, clinic was over and said, oh, we need a, uh, we, we've got more people we need to be vaccinated. So I do have a small list that we, we may work on at some point in the future, but we've hit most of the majority of our um, 1A, our private schools and our, and our daycares. And with the public school systems, we've gotten, I, I think we're probably at about 60 to 70 percent of, uh, of, of the uh, public schools um, folks that we've reached. We, we've got uh, about 1,700 left from uh, the information that, that I talked to Carl Streaker about. About 1,700 left that still want to be vaccinated that are in the public school system. And maybe some of them will get vaccinated somewhere else and maybe they'll get vaccinated through us. But, you know, over the next month, hopefully we'll, we'll knock most of that out. Um, as far as the 75 plus population is concerned, we're, we're getting to about half of those right now. And I can't say what percentage of them aren't going to want to get vaccinated or are going to want to get vaccinated. But the last clinic we did, we did a clinic uh, up at the North Carroll Senior Center, and we reached about 600 people there this week. And that one was a tough one because most of the people we signed up didn't have email or technology and, and, uh, and trying to sign them up for their second doses kind of backed things up a little bit there at that clinic. And, and, and was a little bit more of a wait for people to get out of there where 
generally we've been getting people in and out of the clinic within 20 to 25 minutes. Some, some people were there for 35 or 40 minutes, which I don't think is terrible, but uh, a, a few people who didn't have technology needed to wait in order for us to help them schedule their second appointments. Um, we've got a full court press on this week to uh, try to get people signed up. We've got two clinics in Westminster that are scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday at the Westminster Senior Center. Um, they'll, they'll consist of, uh, it, it's, it's a total of 800 slots. We're working with your citizen services department and all the, all the health department staff that are making calls to try to sign people up who don't have email or access to the internet and get them scheduled here in, in Westminster. I do think uh, the, the demand for the uh, 75 plus is, is dropping off a bit. And, um, you know, we may, within the next three to four weeks, start opening things up to people who are 65 and older. Um, so the, the other thing that I've been trying to do is set aside about 50 doses a week to try to reach hard to reach populations. Um, we're gonna be doing a clinic in conjunction with, uh, with Access Carol this week at their, at their facility to uh, reach some high-risk patients that, uh, that that they have and people who are over that age of uh, 75 and, and just a really hard to reach uh, community. There's a lot of uh, folks that they serve that, that, that could potentially be homeless or, or uh, potentially be uninsured and just not have technology. So we're doing a, a clinic with them uh, this week. And then the next couple of weeks, we're gonna work with LifeBridge and we got this thing we're, we're calling a fly car and essentially, we're going to uh, give them some doses. They're going to go out and uh, they're going to administer these to people who are homebound. And, and then they're going to uh, pick up more doses from our, our mass clinic and go out and hit some more homebound people. I've got a list of about 40 people that, uh, that the uh, Citizen Services Department gave me that are, are not able to leave their homes. And so we're hoping to have those people vaccinated in the next week or so. <laughs> Additionally, um, you know, where, where we're going from here is uh, is, is trying to, the, to set aside a certain number of doses to reach any hard to reach population. I've assigned Sue Doyle, who's our behavioral health uh, bureau chief to be what we call our equity office, officer. And she's working with citizen services to look at subsidized housing and other places where we have people who, who don't really have access to uh, technology to try to make sure we get those people vaccinated. And one of the important pieces that uh, we've talked about, but I wanna make sure we keep advertising this, and I talked to Commissioner Rothstein about this last night, is that uh, you know the county's offered to provide transportation to and from the vaccination clinics if, uh, if somebody has a, a challenge with transportation. And, and um, that's, a, that's a great service we're providing to our citizens. I've emphasized this to our staff who are signing people up. And you know, it's funny because I, I was personally sitting uh, sitting here one day and I had wound up with a lady and I occasionally do wind up with individuals who uh, are having a hard time getting signed up for a clinic. And I, I, I tried to help walk her through getting her signed up. And when we got towards the end, she's like, I'm not sure if my son's gonna be able to take me that day. And as I'm sitting here, one of my staff walked into the office, he's like, don't forget, you can get them transportation. And I was like, oh yeah. So I was like, well, if your son can't take you to that day, you can call and we can get you a ride. So it's an important piece that we need to be thinking about and we need to be advertising better to make sure that people know that uh, not having transportation's not a reason that they can't get vaccinated. And, and uh, you know, the, the, um, the State uh, Department of Aging really wants us to focus on certain, uh, certain um, independent living facilities and that's just not working with, with the way we have things planned. I think we're better off. We're, we're going to uh, regional sites throughout the county. We're reaching the people we need to reach. And if we need to get them transportation, we can get them there. Um, trying to get large numbers of doses out in a, in, a, in a day, as opposed to going to a place where there are 20 or 30 people, it's easier to bring those 20 or 30 people to us. We're gonna reach the homebound. We're gonna, we're gonna make sure that everybody's given an opportunity to get vaccinated who's vulnerable. And, and that's kind of the way that we're we're working through this. Uh, another piece that'll be interesting to you guys is we're planning on sending out invitations to uh, the folks for the continuity of government. That means we can get our commissioners vaccinated, our county administrator, our, our town managers, our, our mayors, and, and the uh, council presidents. 
somewhere down the road in three or four weeks, we'll be looking at trying to vaccinate some public works people, the people who run our water plants, wastewater plants, and, and uh, maintain critical infrastructure. That's still a little ways out. But the week of March the 7th, we're going to be uh, working on that uh, on those elected officials and, and essentially the uh, town and county managers. And um, we're going to be trying to start with the higher education folks. Also that week, we're, we're looking at potentially putting another uh, another 75 plus clinic down in the in the South Carroll area. So just wanted to kind of give you an update as to where we are and where we're going with all of this. I know it's been a lot of information this morning. I've been trying to give you what I think you need to know without making it too long. Uh, of course, check our website, call our call center. Uh, anything we can do to assist people with trying to help them navigate this process, we want to do. We're still very much resource constrained. We don't have enough vaccine to vaccinate everybody who wants to be vaccinated. And we've got to reach the most vulnerable people first. So that's all I have. And commissioners, I'd be glad to uh, to take any questions you would have in, in reference to what I just presented. And as always, thank you. Um, any questions, comments, direction? I just want to, thank, I want to thank Mr. Singer and Mrs. Coons for coming on every week. I think the service you provide during session is so beneficial to our public, but to charts and graphs and put it in perspective, it makes their job easier because if they weren't getting this information from you in these sessions, they'd be calling us wanting to know stuff that we don't know. So as always, thanks for all the effort you guys put into putting this together. It makes their job easier and, and it eliminates a lot of rumors and innuendos out there. When people have ignorance and they they worry about stuff. So all this information is real beneficial to the public. So thanks for all the effort you and your staff put into this. Okay, so yeah, please. So with that said, uh, I appreciate it too, but I've got one, two, three, four, five, six people that have contacted me in the last 48 hours, Ed, in my district, all of them over 75. What do I tell them? Commissioner, if, if you've got a list of four people, send it to me. Um, we're, we're, uh, I've, got six, I've got six right now, and I know they're all over 75. And you know my district. My district has a lot of folks over 75, and and I you know I appreciate what Commissioner Boucher said, but uh, most of those folks don't watch us on on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings. Nor do they have a computer. Nor do they have internet to be able to do that. So uh, I need to tell them something. Right, and, and and we're trying to reach out through uh, citizen services and all. And, and first of all, I want to verify that we're trying to we, we we've we've tried to reach everybody who's on our list. Some people aren't calling us back and aren't answering the phone. I mean, I can't re register register them if they don't answer the phone. That's that's a hard part. But if you send me a list of people who 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 you know want to be vaccinated, we'll reach out to them and and we'll make an effort to. to uh, to register them for a clinic. So if, if you've got a list, you know, any of you commissioners, if you've got a list, please send it to us. We'll we'll uh we'll work on it. If if you got a name and a phone number, we'll we'll try to get to them. Yep, I've got all that. So I'll get that to you later on this morning. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.